Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. I'm back on the M6 this week. If you missed the two previous episodes I did on the M6, be sure to give them a watch. If not, don't worry about it. We'll just carry on from here. And where is here exactly? Here is between junctions 22 and 23 of the M6. And here we find Newton and Willows Motorway Service Station. Or we would if they built it. Instead, it's a maintenance depot and home of the National Highways Regional Control Center. From here, they orchestrate the various repairs and maintenance schedules applied to our motorway network and is one of several sites scattered around the country. But what about the service station that was supposed to be built? Well, they made the same mistake here as they did at the Doxy site. Maybe you should watch those previous videos for context, but if you really can't be asked, the mistake that they made was building the proposed service station sites to a 60s motorway specification. Today, we'd call it dangerous. Back then, it's just how it was. The slip roads are short with very tight turns, and the sites themselves aren't especially large either. Many years later, when they finally decided to build a service station, like Doxy, this site was ruled out almost immediately due to the dangerous design and layout. Since then, it's been repurposed and is now used as a highway maintenance depot, and it's very unlikely it will ever be turned into a service station. However, don't fret, the lack of services at Newton or Willows isn't too much of a problem because just up at Junction 23 you'll find a Shell filling station. It's not an official motorway service station, so the pricing tends to work out a little bit cheaper. That's this week's useful consumer advice. You're welcome. You'll also find what appears to be an abandoned building. This isn't part of the script, I've just stumbled across it myself. Any ideas what it is? Because I don't know. Junction 23 is also known as Haydock Island and it's where the M6 meets the A580. When it was first built, it had a typical roundabout design, but then in the late 60s they made a few changes, which according to website Sabre Roads led to them constructing the first hamburger style roundabout in the UK. This is where you take a normal roundabout and send a main road right through the middle, and I suppose it sort of looks like a hamburger. Junction 25 is interesting because it's a near mile long spur road. It's always been like this since it was completed in 1963, but I'm not really sure why they built it this way. I have a couple of theories, mainly that it was probably the cheapest option, and perhaps it was designed to work alongside Junction 24, which by no coincidence is also missing a set of slip roads. The two junctions combined give us access to the motorway in all directions, and I think it's been set up this way to manage traffic around Ashton and Makerfield. You can tell Junction 25 is of an old design because it's become a bit of an accident hotspot. The problem is that traffic comes barreling down the spur road before quickly arriving at a roundabout that features a particularly tight turn. It's a regular occurrence for vehicles to understeer or crash their way onto the roundabout. And it's funny because we can see evidence of this on street view and satellite images. Somebody's fucked up there, haven't they? Junction 26 is a bizarre junction where the M6 and the M58 meet. We actually covered this in detail in the M58 episode, so instead we're going to take a look at a couple of things that you'll find a short distance from Junction 26. Our first stop is the Heinz Kit Green Food Processing Plant, which is on your right as you head northbound on the M6. Yes, it's the same Heinz as the Baked Bean. This is their largest food processing plant across the world, and it processes around 1.3 billion cans of food every year. Heinz started in 1886, selling out of Fortnum and Mason's, and over the years saw continued success, which led them to building this food processing plant here at Wigan in the 1950s. A few years before Heinz got started, in 1883, on the other side of the M6 that wasn't built yet, a new college would open near Up Holland. This is St. Joseph's College, and take a look at that building, what a masterpiece. It opened as a Roman Catholic seminary, which is basically a school that teaches you to be a priest or whatever. It catered for boys or men aged between 11 and 24, and despite the awesome building and its size, they only ever seemed to have 150 students. By the late 1980s, the number of students had dropped significantly, making it no longer viable to run this extravagant teaching venue. So the decision was made to not enrol any further students and close the seminary in 1992. The site was sold in the mid-90s for housing development, but all of the buildings sat abandoned and derelict for many years, and it's only in recent times that they've started to actually do any work on it. Also, in later years... Yikes! I sure could do with a distraction right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Conway Twitty. Hello, nice to see you. It's been... Back to the M6, and between junctions 26 and 27, we find the Gathurst Viaduct. It's the second largest bridge on the M6 at 240 metres long, and it carries the motorway over the River Douglas, the Leeds Liverpool Canal, and the Manchester to Southport Railway. The canal is 127 miles long and runs from Liverpool to Leeds. The section of canal that runs under the M6 here opened in 1780, which is some 75 years before the railway would come along. The Manchester Southport Railway would open in 1855, with the M6 and the Gathurst Viaduct coming 106 years later, opening. In 1961. There we go, over 240 years of transport history delivered in seven seconds. Boom! 
According to the original plan, Junction 27 was going to be laid out with this rather odd arrangement. Instead, they opted for a more simple roundabout design, but there doesn't seem to be any documented evidence as to why they changed their mind. It might be due to plans that came later on to build a connecting road that would run from Junction 27 into the centre of Wigan. A roundabout layout certainly would have been more suitable for this proposed new road, but looking around, I don't see this new road anywhere. Indeed, it was cancelled, but they did start to build it, which is why Junction 27 has got this rather odd two-lane arrangement connecting up to the A5209. If you follow the lanes along, you might spot a bridge that takes the A5209 over, well, nothing. Had this new connecting road been built to plan, there would have been a dual carriageway where I'm standing right now, going underneath the bridge on its way to Wigan. I'd be doing the people of Leyland a disservice if we didn't stop and talk about the massive impact the town has had on British motor vehicle manufacturing. So, between junctions 28 and 29, we find Leyland Trucks, a manufacturer of trucks in Leyland. To most people, certainly those over the age of 35, when you say the words British and Leyland in the same sentence, it conjures up memories of mass buyouts, company failures, and the entire demise of the British motor industry. Let me know if you want to hear more about that story. It probably deserves a video all on its own. But back to Leyland Trucks, and they're one of the few survivors from this perhaps questionable past. They started out in 1896 as the Lancashire Steam Motor Company, operating from a small workshop right in the heart of Leyland on Herbert Street. By 1968, they had grown to become the fifth largest vehicle producer in the world, but it all went tits up from there and went wrong. Like I said, I'm not gonna go into the history. It needs a video all on its own. What we need to know is that the assembly plant here in Leyland opened in the late 1970s, and then in 1998, Leyland Trucks was bought out by a company called Packard. Packard also owned Daft Trucks and the rather awesome looking Peterbilt Trucks. Under Packard, Leyland continue to manufacture trucks to this very day, meaning Leyland has got 127 years of vehicle manufacturing history. Are there any other cities that can claim such a feat? I'm not so sure. Well done, Leyland. The 1958 Preston Bypass is now open, running for eight and a quarter miles from Bamber Bridge to Broughton. Offering a dual express lane connection around Preston via the A59, future-proof with an extra-wide central reservation so we can add some lanes at a later stage. With no speed limits, your British Leyland motor vehicle will arrive in record time along this newfangled road that we call a motorway. Indeed, this is where it all started. Junction 29 marks the point at which the country's first motorway terminated. It ran from here up to Junction 1 of the M55 and at the time, was an absolute marvel of engineering. The M6 we've just driven up to get here wouldn't be built until the mid-60s, but from this point onwards, we'll be following the route of the country's oldest motorway. There's actually very little left of the original M6 or the Preston Bypass, as it was widened in the 90s, along with several other changes over the years. However, if you know where to go, Brindle Road, you'll find a bridge, which is the only structure still in place as it was constructed and installed. This rather unassuming road bridge that crosses the M6 was built way back in the 50s, and it still stands to this day, having managed to escape from any works or widening on the motorway. Today's Junction 31 served as the only junction you'd find on the Preston Bypass, and it can take the title of the first grade-separated motorway junction in the UK. Originally, it was built as a partial cloverleaf junction so as to avoid the need to build any additional bridges over the River Ribble. At the junction, you'll find this plaque that commemorates the opening of the country's first motorway. Opened by the then Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, he was the first person to travel on a motorway and he set off from here at Junction 31. Widening works to the M6 would come along in the 90s, which resulted in some additional slip roads being built as well as two new bridges, which is why today the junction's got a rather odd look about it. Junction 31A was not built as part of the Preston Bypass and opened in the 90s. Interestingly though, according to the original plans, there was supposed to be a junction built here in the 50s, but because other road building projects were cancelled around Preston, they didn't bother. Fast forward to the 90s, and with the construction of several commercial units in the area, they decided to dig out the old plan, remove a couple of the slip roads, and bang out Junction 31A over a weekend. Junction 32 is where the M6 meets the M55. Earlier, we said that the original Preston Bypass ended at Junction 1 of the M55, but it sort of didn't really, because the M55 didn't exist, and neither did Junction 32. Instead, the motorway would just sort of bend round to the left and join the A6. Initially, this was done as a temporary measure, but when the motorway was extended from Preston to Lancashire, they decided to keep what they had and build today's interchange around it. And it was also another first for the UK, because Junction 32 was the first three-level interchange ever built. Between Junctions 32 and 33 is probably the most famous landmark we've got on all of our motorways. You won't miss the massive concrete Pennine Tower that you'll find at Lancaster or Forton services. It was designed to mimic an air traffic control tower and it came about as the result of perhaps some rather quirky regulations. 
Back then, motorway service stations were not allowed to advertise their presence to road users. Even things like simple advertising boards were out of the question. So companies used clever building design to ensure that their services wouldn't go unnoticed. So in a way, the Pennine Tower is a massive advertising billboard, but without actually advertising anything. Within the tower, when it first opened, would have been a high-end restaurant serving things like lobster, steak and shrimps at a service station. On the top was a customer accessible sun terrace, which really was just access to the roof. Nothing too amazing, but of course, the view from the top and the unique proposition of going up the tower surely made for a memorable experience. Apparently not, actually. Only after a few years of opening, the restaurant and tower began to struggle with the business running at a loss. Cutbacks were made, quickly, with the high-end restaurant becoming a basic trucker's lounge and the shrimp and steaks replaced with basic service station food. You know, the crap that they've now got a reputation for. By 1989, it was all over as far as the public were concerned and the tower was shut off. It did continue to be used by staff for storage and training up until 2004, but since then, the tower's pretty much sat abandoned. So after 20 years of just being sat, will we ever see a return of the Pennine Tower? No. And there we are then guys, that's all we've got time for this week. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is of course a button specifically for that. And if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so. That'd be wicked sweet awesome. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John, you've been watching Auto Shenanigans and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Till then, take care, bye-bye.